Smack. Okay. Yeah, I'm weird. Okay, so we're talking about scientific reasoning. We've already talked about lab safety and the basics of that. Uh, then we started talking about the scientific method. Uh, now we're going to talk about a little bit about the thought process behind the scientific scientific method. So let's jump right in to the two types of reasoning, and you'll need to know the differences between these two and how to use them. There is induction and deduction. You'll also call it inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. Um, induction starts from an observation, as you see here on this very nicely made graphic, and then goes to a theory. Okay. Deduction starts with kind of a blanket theory and then applies that to a specific observation. So, like an example would be um, with induction. Say, well, let me give you a deductive one first. If I said all seniors have senioritis, okay, and then I say John is a senior, therefore he has senioritis, since all seniors have it. That is deductive. I took a blanket theory that all seniors have senioritis, and then I applied it to the first senior that I saw. Okay. Now, induction would be more along the lines of saying three seniors that I have talked to have said that they have senioritis. Therefore, it seems that all seniors have senioritis. And then you would go and you would test that. Okay. Scientific method is more inductive, uh, but uh, there is method, there is a place for deduction as well. So, inductive reasoning, moving from specific observations to broad generalizations and theories. Um, so you start with those specific observations, you detect patterns in, patterns in it, and then you develop a hypothesis, and after that hypothesis you test it, explore it, and then you have a conclusion. Sounds a lot like the scientific method because it pretty much is. Deductive reasoning is the one from general, broad category, and then specific. Uh, and so you start with that theory, then you narrow it down and test it, um, and have a very specific hypothesis, and then um, you narrow it down even further until you collect that data. And so the way that this works with science, um, through experimentation and knowledge, like I'll use chemistry because I know chemistry well, um, you take the noble gases in chemistry. Uh, and you would do experimentation to determine that noble gases are stable. Well, the way you would use in, that you would use deductive uh, thought is you would say, okay, well, since all noble gases are stable, neon is a noble gas, therefore neon must be stable. And so deductive reasoning kind of comes in after you've done the experiment to be able to apply it to other things but then you would still need to go and test and make sure that neon is stable and that that works and so the process just keeps repeating over and over again uh, and so these analogies um, to form theories kind of like the like I just said with with neon gas um, you know that since it is a noble gas that it's stable and so it would apply to another one and it goes on and on and on you use, scientists use analogies um, and so these, they use both of these methods interchangeably to create experiments. Experimental control. This is just basically trying to keep um, an experiment um, safe from outside influences. Um, and so with experimental control, you try to only change one thing, which would be the variable. Okay. Uh, so if you're in a lab, you want consistent conditions with every single thing you're testing. If you're trying to grow a particular bacteria in a petri dish, okay, you're not going to have a, you know the petri dish in the lab one day and then take it out, leave it in your car for like four days after that, and then bring it back and expect to have the same results as the other dishes that were in the lab. Now that might be actually a part of your experiment, though. You might have a petri dish with a control bacteria that you leave on the desk. Then you might have one that you add heat to it, you might have another one that you put it in the cold and you see, so the only thing that you are changing is one particular variable, but you have a control. Okay, does that, hopefully that makes sense. As does that make sense as if you're going to look at the screen and say, yes, Mr. Smith, that makes sense. Or, no, I have a question. Okay, so in an experiment, you generally only have one variable that's changed. You would not have a dish that you're growing bacteria in, one that you're heating, and then, you know, and then just random changes, okay? Instead of having it in a dish over here, you have it in a bowl, okay? Like just a cereal bowl that you got at home. See, that would be changing more than one variable. 
So, um, observations. They're observations. They're recorded facts. Remember, if, you, if it wasn't written down, it didn't actually happen. There's quantitative, um, which is a numerical data. You're weighing something. It's, it's mass, 2.05 grams. That's quantitative. Qualitative would be describing it, okay? Um, you have a chemical reaction. You see that there is effervescence, there's bubbles, you know, there's things like that. That is qualitative. Uh, and then ultimately you make your conclusions based on the data and observations. You can't just make it up, okay? It's based on your data. And so sometimes you win and your hypothesis is proved and you still need to test it again or it's wrong and you got to start all the way over. And there are some lovely resources that we'll talk about in class. Have a lovely evening.